Hello, um, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Romina Bandura. I'm a senior fellow here at CSIS and I have the pleasure of hosting this event today on the mobile revolution and its impact on developing countries. Today uh, is an important day. It marks the 50th anniversary of the first uh, mobile phone call. Um, and so we're going to be discussing how this important um, uh, fact uh, altered and really was a, a big positive disruptor for um, everybody and in, especially in developing countries. I'm going to say a few words. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the era of mobile communications uh, began 50 years ago when Martin Cooper, who was the head of Motorola's communication systems division, he placed the first call uh, ever made from a handheld device. Um, and the call went to uh, Joe Engel, who was um, the rival at the moment from Bell Labs. Um, today, as of, as of, let's say, 2015, there's an estimated 94% of low and middle income countries that have mobile access. Um, and this has helped, you know, not only with communications, but with other um, you know sectors, finance, um, uh, commerce, and and others. So today we are here uh, with um, Marty and um, and also Mr. Uh, Philip Auerswald and uh, Iqbal Quadir. I'm going to introduce them to the to the audience. Uh, Philip is a professor at George Mason University. Um, Scholar School of Policy and Government, and he's a well-renowned uh, author and the founding board chair and president of the National Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. His work focuses on entrepreneurship, technology, and innovation in a global context. Welcome, um, uh, Philip. Um, Iqbal Quadir is a senior fellow with the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard. For over 25 years, Iqbal has been building and helping others build enterprises to serve um, and economically empower average citizens in the developing world. Uh, through these efforts, he has helped create and co-create companies that today serve more than 100 million people. In 1996, he founded uh, Grameen Phone, uh, which was a total game-changing uh, mobile network in, in Bangladesh, as you know, and covers now 99% of the population. So um, welcome, uh, the three of you. Uh, we have uh, now a conversation between uh, Martin, uh, Philip, and uh, Iqbal. So greetings, Marty. It's terrific uh, that you ha are able to join us on this very special and historic day. I know that I feel honored and privileged uh, to be having this discussion with you, but I think Iqbal feels uh, even more that way as a mobile entrepreneur himself. That I'm uh, both thrilled and and embarrassed to be invited to uh, to talk to this group and to uh, to both of you, uh, because uh, you are fulfilling a, a dream that I've had for a long time. Uh, I don't believe that in the future uh, a, a student can get a, a proper education without being connected to the internet full time. Uh, I don't think that uh, healthcare can occur in the future. In fact, I think that there is a potential in the future for all diseases to be conquered right. uh, by virtue of having people be connected. Now, you know, both of those sound uh, 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 maybe too ambitious, uh, but there's no, no doubt in my mind. Now, I don't think that a teacher can teach a class today to students who have access to all the information in the world by just giving them lectures. So the yes. whole nature of what teaching is is going to change. We already have sensors that can anticipate disease in people before the diseases happen. Right. So the uh, mobile phone is moving from an accessory, from an extension of a person to an absolute necessity. And, and mm -hmm. there is the opportunity doing uh, what your organization is doing, uh, where the uh, uh, undeveloped countries can actually leapfrog the uh, more advanced countries, because uh, that, that's already happened in Africa, where there are many more people on 
uh, of mobile phones than there are on wired phones. Uh, and in Africa, it's already been demonstrated that uh, poverty can be attacked by the mobile phone. So uh, I'm, I am absolutely thrilled at what you guys are doing. I'm embarrassed that I haven't heard about it before, but uh, but I know about it now, and I hope that I will have a continuing association with your group. Yes. Well, thank Marty, you so much. Yeah, Marty. In the in around 1990, I used to my I used to work in a private equity group in investment banking type um, venture capital type of group, and we were our space was adjacent to Metro Mobile headquarters. And that's where Metro Mobile used to be a big mobile phone company. This is about 32 years ago, mm -hmm. um, founded by George Lindemann. And that's where I started hearing your name. And um, since then I had this aspiration to someday meet you. So it's great to be able to meet you here. And uh, I wanted to say that subsequently I actually worked in a building next to the 53rd and 54th Street corner, famous corner, where you made the phone call from in oh. New York City. Yeah. You tell me that I was in the Alliance building. Is that possible? No. You know, I, I, yes, I think so. I think exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. That's exactly where our base station was on the, right, right, on the roof right. of that. There's building. a Hilton Hotel now in that in that next building or so. Yeah. That's, that's exactly yeah. right. So I, I, I loved uh, reading your, your many insights in the book, especially you made the point that in, in page 166, in case you remember, yeah. is that the problems in developing countries were not, of course, caused by the lack of cell phone, but the cell phone is addressing them in many ways. Do, would you, could you spend a minute on uh, elaborating that a little bit more? Well, repeat the there, there's a line you have in your book yes. uh, that says the, there are many problems which keeps poverty preserved in 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 quote yes. unquote poor countries. Okay, yes. they're not obviously caused by the lack of cell phones originally because they're caused by other sources. Sure, but cell phone is a solution to them. So absolutely. Can, yeah, I'm very interested in that. And I'll tell you more about that, but please tell me what your thoughts are on that. No, I, I believe that this is happening in your country. Yes. I think in Bangladesh now, uh, you have the concept of uh, microfinancing. Yes, yes. So a woman in a village can uh, get financing and actually own a cell phone. Yes. And she rent out that cell phone to the local farmers or yes. local fishermen yes. by the second. Right. And they can then, uh, when they have a product to sell, whether it's fish or, or grain or, right. or right. vegetables, right. You know, they can survey the surrounding villages, get the best price yes. for their product. Right. And the people in the surrounding villages get access to more food. Yeah. Okay. So yes. you know, it's, it's a, everybody wins. Right, of course, of course. And I, oh. I believe that that's going on uh, today, and it's only a, a symptom of yes. what can happen yes. in the future. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. it's, it's so exciting to me uh, and, uh, when people ask me about the progress we've made with uh, mobile phones, I tell them we are just starting, it's just the beginning. Right. And I'm, I'm just thrilled that you uh, are working on this in, in a yes. very serious yes. way. Yeah. So, uh, Actually, I, I, I am the one who brought microcredit and cell phone together in, wow. in Bangladesh. Yes, and that's why I approached Grameen Bank, and which led to the creation of Grameen Phone. But, but when, when did you, well, of course, your work 50 years ago, of course, was analog based. When did you think that it will become digital? I mean, it ultimately started to become digital in 92, in 1992. But did you foresee that it's going to become a digital and what the implications would be? Well, of course we do that because uh, uh, analog only works up to a certain point, uh, capacity. Right. You right. reach a limit of the capacity, you have to go on. Digital. Uh, so digital is extremely yeah. important. And by the way, the digital changes have not stopped. You know, right. we're up to the fifth generation now Right. Uh, I believe that we are off on a wrong tack uh, with right. using uh, millimeter wave frequencies, but there are all kinds of digital ways to expand the radio frequency spectrum. 
right. spectrum is not going to be a problem in, in the future. The, right. The, the problem of the future is the kind of vision that you are expressing when you talked about starting out with with the microfinancing, but bringing uh, mobile telephone capability to everybody, not mm -hmm. just the wealthy people, not just the commercial people, but right. every person on right. earth. Right. And right. we are getting close to the connectivity point. Right. Think about it, uh, that two thirds of the people on earth today have, uh, have mobile phone service. Right, right. right. And, Actually, uh, it's getting to be even more. And, and frankly, there are more mobile phones in the world than number of people now. Yes, but it's just that some people have more than one, and little kids don't have one, so the number don't exactly match. But it's yeah. there are actually more mobile phones than number of people, yeah. and nothing else, at least I know, is like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, housing, whatever, or healthcare, anything else. Yeah. Um, so, I, I I do have a criticism by by the way. You know, guys are both smiling at me, so I have to attack. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you, uh, one of the comments I noticed in your literature is that you say 94% of the uh, people in the world have access to... Uh, uh, Maybe it should be 100%. Uh, what, uh, pardon? What number did you say? I I'm saying in terms of getting access, it should be perhaps 100%. It absolutely you, should be, but yeah. I want you to know that the carriers, in many cases, are distorting the the, the data. I see. And and, uh, and and the only reason I bring that up is the kinds of things that you are talking about. Right. About uh, mobile service to everybody with education, healthcare, safety. Uh, involve uh, getting the cost down. And the coverage up, and yet many of the carriers are focused on 5G, 6G. This is a right. future robotics running factories. They are working on the Internet of Things, right. and have not finished the Internet of People. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> That's a great quote. That's a great quote, Marty. Right. Uh, I, start, I started to say earlier that uh, your foresight has proved correct in the past. Right. Uh, I love the fact that you had the uh, spur of the moment inspiration to call Joel Engel, who believed that the future of mobile was to extend the AT&T network using uh, cars. Uh, and cars are mobile, but they're definitely not handheld. So right. um, I, 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 but as you know, thinking along those lines, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, about Cooper's law that I think you just alluded to, where, where today, you know, recalling your, your famous first call, um, on the Dynatech, but um, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about spectrum and how you are radio frequency and how you feel like it can continue to be expanded uh, to lead to further cost reductions? Well, the, the myth is that spectrum is like beachfront property. You know, once you use it up, it's uh, not a. There's no more spectrum available. That's absolutely wrong, mm. because uh, if you think about it, when Marconi first commercialized radio. You could hold maybe four conversations on the entire Earth. Yes. And some, we now have went through the period of radio, television, now the Internet. We've never run out of spectrum. So mm -hmm. something is happening. And, right. and I uh, created a, a, a law called the Law of Spectral, spectral Capacity. Right. And it says that we have doubled the capacity of the existing radio spectrum every 30 months for 120 years. Incredible. And if you, if, if you do the arithmetic, that's 10 trillion times. Yeah. And it, wow. it, it's all done with technology, whether it's digital, right. yeah. smart antennas, uh, expanding right. the frequency range. And, and uh, there, we know enough about the technology to know we, with existing technology, we can go another 50 years. Right, um, right, right. Amazing. Spectrum is not the problem. And right, focusing on what the opportunities are. Right, right. Exactly. So we have, we, we have a spectrum analogy to Moore's law. Yeah. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice of you to put it that way, but yes, right. that's right. A, yeah. exactly right. And you know, I'm suggesting that spectrum is not going to be the problem. Right. The investment, as you are doing, 
right is in Bangladesh and, and uh, other places that's what the opportunity is getting right. to get you know I, I'm repeating myself but for for human beings uh, coverage and cost are the two most important issues right uh, in the United States I'm, in, I'm a, a embarrassed to say we have the highest cost internet uh, in the world mm. that's mm. a shame Absolutely. Because you know who who is hurt by that? It's the poorest people. Yeah. So, mm. so uh, uh, somehow we have to. There has to be a change in focus, uh, and there has to be an obligation of people that use the radio spectrum to cover everybody, not just uh, the wealthy. Right. Right. Well, no, but cell phone fire. has gone a long way in solving that problem. In yeah. uh, I guess not enough has it hasn't gone enough because of various other constraints that human beings impose. But but cell phone technology has done its best in advancing the cause of inclusivity, including everybody. Yeah. Uh, like if you had to put wires to everybody's home, that would have been far more constraining than because you can you no can divide it. the spectrum into. Uh, many ways and reach all sorts of people that you couldn't do if you had to reach everybody's home by wires because that has a fixed cost of actually putting down the the labor to yeah. get it to that and you cannot reallocate the frequency through the wire the history so, has proven that to be true uh, yes. Martin, we're we're in, inspired uh by your vision we share in your mission uh we also know you have a busy day ahead of you um, and really appreciate the comments uh, that you've offered. Uh, it couldn't be more, uh, you know, in the spirit of the event uh, that we've organized today. Uh, yeah. We're just absolutely delighted you were able to join us. Uh, you know, as we as we release you to a, a you know a day of of celebration that you have uh, planned uh, and and uh, you know we'll be experiencing today in New York. Do you have any uh, sort of final thoughts um, on uh, you know the topic that we've discussing the particularly, um, you know, the internet of people and how mobile telephony can continue to contribute to making that, um, you know, a reality, um, you know, even more so than has been the case, uh, you know, in the past 50 years, continuing that legacy. Well, I, I have to repeat that I'm thrilled at what uh, your group is doing. Uh, you know, I can only have ideas. Somebody has to implement them. Uh, and it sounds like you are people that can do that. Yeah. And, and to me, that is uh, the most heartwarming thing that happened to me in a long time. I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to well, talk thank to you. Thank you. Thank and, you. And, and uh, perhaps you. Uh, please allow Phil and I to visit you in San Diego sometime by the before the end of the year. You you are very welcome. If you come, you will be greeted with open arms. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, we'll look forward much. to that. And Thank we do you. see this as a as a full year of celebration of the yes. 50th yes. year of yes. mobile. So we're planning, uh, you know, more in the future. But but we're so grateful for today. So have a wonderful day in New York. Thank you very much. Also, thanks to Arlene for having uh, helped yes. get us together. Uh, it's it's terrific that you're able to celebrate this day with her and also uh, our, our our French Seren. So. I, I will see them both in a minute and relay that. Great. Wonderful. Thank well, you. Thank, you, thank, again, Martin. you. thank you so much for making the Great to meet both of you. And now I'm going to turn to um, Philip for a presentation uh, and for your opening remarks. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your journey and how do you see, you know, the mobile uh, revolution um, impacting the developing world? Well, uh, Romina, thank you so much uh, for hosting us today uh, on this really uh, momentous occasion of the first phone call placed on a handheld cellular phone. Um, and uh, I hope that you all enjoyed the uh, conversation that Iqbal and I uh, just had with Marty Cooper, Cooper, pictured here on that day, April 3rd, 1973, uh, speaking on a Dynatac 8000X. <laughs> Uh, which uh, a, a decade later uh, sold for uh, $3,995. Uh, and this was the first handheld mobile phone. Um, actually sold uh, uh, surprisingly well, um, given the price point, uh, but it's gotten cheaper since. Um, as uh, Romina mentioned, um, Marty placed that first historic call to Joel Engel. And uh, Joel was, in his own rights, a pioneer of mobile telephony, 
um, and uh, created uh, uh, a number of the technologies underlying the uh, network uh, uh, over which mobile phones are deployed. But the vision that AT&T had was of mobile phones uh, being placed in cars and vehicles. Mm -hmm. And it was really to extend uh, AT&T's monopolistic network that sort of last mile in a vehicle. And uh, uh, Marty Cooper had a very different vision. He had a vision of, of real human mobility and of placing the mobile phone in uh, a handheld device. And so he's also um, the, uh, the lead inventor on the uh, first patent for a handheld mobile phone. Um, now, uh, you know, it's important when we think about uh, this day uh, to recognize, of course, the many, many contributions, scientific, technological, uh, and business contributions that led up to April 3rd, 1973. And, and a, a remarkable number of those came from uh, the Bell system, and in particularly uh, Bell Labs. Uh, so here we have, uh, you know, the team behind the uh, the transistor that then became the semiconductor, um, the uh, the cellular concept, a paper written by Bell Labs technicians that really spelled out uh, the overlapping hexagon of uh, territory that defined the underlying uh, mobile technology. And of course, um, you know, one of the real geniuses of the last century, Claude Shannon, whose paper written while he was at Bell Labs, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which underlies really the digital uh, communications aspect, uh, which is the core aspect these days of mobile telephony. Having said that, Motorola was uh, a company with, of course, a very uh, proud tradition um, in walkie-talkies in World War II, a communications company that had been a pioneer for decades uh, before that auspicious day, but uh, compared to Bell Labs, was still uh, the outsider upstart. Um, and the FCC really didn't consider Motorola to be a serious um, potential contributor to mobile telephony and was on the cusp of allocating uh, the mobile spectrum that it had just decided to create after a lengthy delay uh, mm -hmm. of decades um, entirely to Bell Labs. And so, um, so Marty Cooper uh, and his team came up with this demonstration of the handheld mobile phone as a way of demonstrating, a way of proving that this technology not only existed and was usable in a handheld form, but also that, that Motorola had a leadership role. So thereafter, uh, after 1973, um, you know, we did see uh, the first mobile networks actually deployed in Japan and in Scandinavia before the United States. Um, the uh, Dynatech, again, uh, you know, was available a decade later. Um, and then finally in 1991 in Finland um, was the uh, launch of the first digital cellular network. Um, and, and at that point, uh, you know, another fundamental driver of the mobile revolution came into play, uh, which was Moore's Law. And, mm. uh, you know, so uh, that uh, uh, team of people pushing that crate up a ramp uh, is pushing five me megabytes of storage in 1956. Uh, and uh, today's, uh, uh, this is a recent generation Intel chip, uh, but any computer chip obviously has uh, tremendously more power and we have greater, uh, in, in, almost, almost infinitely, although not quite infinitely, more storage capacity uh, in today's mobile phones. Now, what was that discontinuity, um, you know, not just in 1973, because it really took quite some time uh, thereafter, uh, as, as we just saw, uh, for mobile phones to come into use and then to become digital. Uh, this is the Human Development Report of uh, from 2001, and um, it, it's about making new technologies work for human development. And what it, what it points out is that even technologies that were a century old at that point, electricity, tractors, telephones, Phones, in fact, a century and a half old, um, we're barely <coughs> reaching, uh, you know, 10, 20 percent of the population worldwide. And uh, telephones were a remarkable uh, case in point. Um, and, uh, you know, what, 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 what happened in the, um, in, in the years after, really primarily after 2000, 
was that there was this incredible takeoff in mobile telephony. Now, we take it for granted, um, but um, you know, the, the reality that uh, there are more phones than people, which has been the case now for three or four years at least, mm -hmm. um, and, and this is more mobile connected device than people, um, is something that truly is remarkable and, and took the efforts of many, uh, many people globally, including Iqbal Qadir, who's with us today, um, who really started the first mobile telephone company that was directed at universal access in a global majority country. That is to say, in a country that is representative of the global majority population. And so, um, so this is a, a chart actually from Marty Cooper's book, Cutting the Cord, <laughs> which I'm very happy to put a plug in for because it is Marty's, uh, Marty's day. Um, and um, this chart shows a comparison of landline penetration versus mobile phone penetration. And it's not at all surprising uh, to see that, that, that remarkable difference. And in fact, landlines, uh, you know, again, unsurprisingly, have actually dropped off uh, since the early 2000s. Um, what has that done to global development? Well, um, I, I'm just going to you know, close with a few remarks on the topic that primarily Iqbal and Ramina will be discussing in just a few minutes. Um, you know, certainly, we can look at it by the numbers. And uh, the GSMA has recently come out with a report, its 2022 report, documents $4.5 trillion of economic value created by mobile phones. A uh, little over a billion dollars of, of direct transactional value uh, and additional value leading up, uh, adding up to that $4.5 trillion. And I refer any uh, listeners to that report for the details of how that they arrived at that estimate. Um, but um, the, you know, that constitutes 5% of global GDP. Mm. So it is a remarkable uh, number. But what, what really, what really is, is powerful and significant, I think, came up in the discussion that we just had with Marty uh, about mobile telephony is its applications. And um, it's obviously, the mobile telephone now is a, is a powerful supercomputer in our pockets. Uh, it gives that, that supercomputing power to, uh, at this point, literally everybody on the planet who uh, you know, seeks to have it. Um, and this, this quote is from a, a piece that Iqbal wrote uh, in a, a journal that he and I co-founded. Uh, I invited him as a co-editor to write this piece about his experience uh, creating uh, technologies to reach global majority populations. Um, and um, you know, what, what, what Iqbal was, was pointing out out of his own experience um, was that uh, the, the, the needs, the unmet needs of a global majority population constitute uh, not just business opportunities, but the greatest business opportunities in any given generation. Um, one of the examples that Iqbal gives is the printing press. Hmm. And Johannes Gutenberg, we remember distantly uh, as the inventor of the printing press, which seems like a, a wonderful thing to have done. Um, but what that what that uh, what that underestimates is the tenacity, grit, uh, mm -hmm. you know, vision, determination uh, that 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 process took. Um, and uh, you know, Gutenberg uh, did not invent movable type. Movable type was invented in China uh, using porcelain uh, in about uh, 1050 uh, AD. Uh, and then metal movable, movable type uh, was first developed in Korea about 300 years after that. Uh, it was about a century after that that Gutenberg had the notion of using movable type in combination with a wine press. And so these are two existing technologies uh, that he combined to create the, the, uh, the printing press, but it was really putting that into action and, and, and making it um, uh, you know, a, 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 a foundational technology that could be copied and used elsewhere. And so as Jeff Jarvis uh, you know, points out in his great book, uh, Gutenberg the Geek, uh, in 50 <laughs> years after Gutenberg's invention, 20 million books were published, more than had been copied by all the scribes in Europe during the millennium before. And that is what discontinuous change reaching majority population looks like. Um, and uh, the, the really the definitive uh, work on Gutenberg's life uh, by Albert Kepper, uh, you know, points out that, that he really was this, this entrepreneur um, who, who put all the pieces together uh, to realize technical advance. Um, the great Jovish, Joseph Schumpeter emphasized this process hmm. of reducing the cost of goods, and in this case, 
he makes uh, reference to silk stockings, but I think we can all agree that uh, mobile phones are at least as valuable as silk stockings uh, to human welfare. Um, that reducing the cost of goods and services is the driver of development, period, but that, of course, includes development in countries that are still ascending in global markets, of which Bangladesh is one. Um, I have to also note uh, a very uh, important book on this topic uh, by uh, the uh, wonderful uh, Clayton Christensen um, and uh, his uh, co-authors, um, who um, you know, made uh, very much the same point in The Prosperity Paradox. And then finally, Martin Cooper, in his book, uh, you know, similarly talks about how mobile telephones have been a powerful tool for solving practical uh, challenges in global development that mm -hmm. go well beyond uh, communications. And um, you know, one thing I have not done in these brief introductory remarks um, is to, to uh, uh, give examples of all the ways in which mobile telephones have directly impacted developments, I think many people, uh, the process of development, I think anybody mm -hmm. watching this uh, is aware of those and, um, you know, it would take, uh, it, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll allude to some right now, uh, but um, but that's that's a talk in itself. So, um, so I personally, you know, delighted and honored uh, to be part of this day, uh, to have an opportunity to introduce the discussion uh, that is the, the featured event uh, of the day uh, between Romina and Iqbal. Uh, and um, really to uh, honor uh, the determination of uh, Marty Cooper and his own singular vision in, in, in insisting upon the power of telecommunications, of mobility, and ultimately of connectivity. Mm -hmm. And as we'll find, connectivity as productivity has become uh, Iqbal's tagline <laughs> over these many decades. Uh, but um, you know, I was delighted to, uh, and not at all surprised, to see uh, a very similar uh, vision shared by Marty Cooper, uh, who was uh, the inventor of the first mobile uh, uh, handheld phone and the individual who placed the first call 50 years ago today. So with that, Romina, um, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you guys uh, are going yeah, to be saying. Yeah, of course. This. Thank you, Philip. And I can't wait to read the book. Um, and you know, we started talking about you know, the vision and of companies. But I wanted to turn to you, to, to, to you Iqbal, because um, in the development world, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, innovation happening. Uh, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It also uh, uh, happens with, in partnership with governments or maybe with you know, development finance institutions. So I wanted to hear what the journey was uh, for you in, in Bangladesh and how did you know, government help or hinder uh, and how did the you know, DFIs, development finance institutions, play a role in this um, you know, mobile revolution um, sure. in your country? And in developing countries, and you know, I still remember. Uh, we were talking about this. Um, I'm from Argentina, so uh, I remember, you know, seeing some people uh, in the streets with this, you know, big brick <laughs> <laughs> in their hands. And you can also, for for the viewers, um, remember the iconic uh, movie, you know, Wall Street, where he's uh, holding the. Yeah. And that was, you know, like. One uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like cutting edge technology and you know some of our younger viewers will probably you know be laughing at us but you know that was right. you know very very cutting edge uh, at that time and it led sure. to all the you know the smartphones that we have now and um, so Iqbal sorry I went you know no, that's I, I did a big circle but uh, tell yeah. us about the journey in, in Bangladesh. Sure first of all I did not um, like Martin Cooper who's day we're celebrating today. Uh, he is a scientist engineer to develop the phone, but I had no role in that. But I was aware of the economics, how that works out. And particularly when it took a jump in 1991, when it got first digitized, as Phil mentioned, in Finland, and subsequently in 1992 in the United States. I was an investment professional in New York by that time. Mm -hmm. But I came when I was 18 year old to college and whatnot. And I was working as an investment professional in New York. And I was aware of what it means. So what I did is that the connectivity is productivity if we focus on that. Connectivity part, I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But that it can lead to productivity was my thought. Right. And luckily I was born in Bangladesh, which was quote unquote very low income country. 
and had a terrible situation about, uh, about telecommunications. Yeah. Only one out of 400 people had a phone. And so I thought that if the, it is getting digitized, therefore it will ride on the Moore's Law that is changing the world. In, at that, up to that point in 1992, it was not in mobile technology, mm -hmm. but in computing. So whatever was happening in computing, like big mainframes are becoming small computers or on laptops or, or on the desktops, I thought that would happen on cell phones. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into that. And over time, I realized that this thing, because of Moore's Law, $1,000 worth of microchips become $1 in 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I started planning on how to distribute these phones. And so I, appro I realized that it can go to the poorest people in the world. And that is why I approached a microcredit organization. Bangladesh was known for microcredit programs. Approached the microcredit organization that they could distribute the phones. And that is how I ended up creating a company called Gramin Phone. Mm -hmm. And now the country has 100 uh, 70 million phones, which is larger, uh, slightly larger than the population of the country, like the rest of the world. But so that vision that cell phones could go to everybody has actually worked out. And because this Moore's Law is playing out still, mm -hmm. okay, that there's massive amount of computing power in the handheld machines. So I more or less, and it has made people more productive. And the GDP of the country, of course, has gone up through many other, for many other reasons. But this is one of the prominent reasons how it has boosted the technology. The government has helped. Uh, the current prime minister, for instance, was in power in 1996 when the license was awarded. And uh, of course, the other financing we got some, the question you were asking. Yeah. We got some financing from international organizations. But the key problem, on the, at the same time, the main force was the Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. And the only role I played is to seeing the consequence of that Moore's Law. And that indeed it could go to everybody. And it has played out very well. And one, the point he was making is something to keep in mind. That the worldwide, the impact of mobile technology now is $4.5 trillion. But let's remember, what was the GDP of the most powerful country in 1973? That was the United States. Its GDP was $1.5 trillion. Mm. So that means three United States wow. mm -hmm. of America has been created. <laughs> the most powerful country of that time is just, just playing arithmetic okay? yeah. by the mobile technology out of quote-unquote thin air. <laughs> <laughs> almost, literally, almost literally. Almost literally. Almost literally. Almost literally. Almost literally. Yes. And I yes. mean, I, and we've talked about this many times, but um, you know, I, I, at the time that you started, uh, had first had the vision and idea right. for Grameen Phone, say 93, right. it was what, uh, one in 100 one, one, Americans one in, had a digital? Yeah, one in, yeah, one percent of Americans had hmm. digital cell phone at the time. So I was going to the poor country and the yeah, poor of the no poor beta. country, that was doubly crazy, okay? So a lot of people, of course, uh, discouraged me, uh, but that's how I say I began to lose hair, but eventually <laughs> I got, got, it, got it done. <laughs> okay. but, I lost hair just talking to you about it. <laughs> right. So, um, Iqbal, you mentioned about productivity, and, you know, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the phone is... Uh, uh, not only a means for, of communication, but it has touched upon many sectors. Yes, um, of course. And so can you talk a little bit about how, you know, um, mobile phones have um, affected, you know, finance, have affected um, health? Um, you know, we even saw with uh, COVID, you know, um, children joining, you know, uh, many didn't have computers. They had sure. to use maybe, you know, phones or other uh, technology. So uh, can you talk a little bit sure. about how uh, you saw this, you know, just uh, the mobile phone not just being a communication device, but, you know, uh, enabler of other uh, activity, um, sure. and not only, you know, economic activity, but social activity, yeah. education. 
So first of all, cell phones allow people to keep in touch with their friends and families. Mm -hmm. That alone is an improvement of life. After yeah. all, at the end of the day, economic activity is purpose is to improve lives. So that improvement is happening automatically if, I have, if somebody had a phone. But then on top of that, as I explained, the connectivity is, I mean summarized connectivity, is, that it, it does give rise to various kind of productive roles. Mm -hmm. But key way to think about it is that any economic activity is, is, is like our bodies have a blood flow. Similarly, information flow is fundamental to any kind of economic activities. I cannot coordinate with anybody else unless I can convey what I'm doing, where will I meet him, etc. Those things are possible because everybody has a phone now. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how it's impacting on everything. Okay. So the whole, let's say, a population of a given country is simply operating in a more efficient way. So now we can always go into specific examples like transportation or le let's say I'm asking a friend to come over to my place, he's mm -hmm. coming, and I say, oh, on your way, please uh, pick up this from that store. Okay. Then he doesn't have to come all the way to me, take that information, and then go back again. So then he gets it done twice as fast and perhaps uh, far more efficiently with a lot less cost of time or gas or whatever. Okay. So, so connectivity can constrain connect real resources. Real res constrain real resources and save real resources. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it has created a lot of um, business opportunities As a result, yeah. and employment and, opportunities, and, and, and right? Businesses are operating more efficiently. Mm -hmm. okay. And efficiently means less resources being used, means those resources are being released for other activities, whether it's people, whether it's gasoline, whether it's anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a even in a in a farmer is able to communicate with the market, okay, or the pre people who are who are buying bulk from the farmers and then taking it to the market, or a child is going to school, yep. and the parents are feel secure when they can keep in touch with the child. So it's just it's just infinite ways that it is make, simply but one way to summarize it. The people are simply coordinating with their activities with other people far more efficiently. Yeah, and well, sorry, yeah. yes, yeah, you so wanted I to just, say. I wanted to follow up because I, I feel as though there have to be uh, viewers uh, who are at this point thinking about all the ills of connectivity mm. um, that uh, you know have been increasingly documented and that we you know experience so political disinformation uh, you know phone addiction and there's considerable and I think a very real concern about uh, teen depression associated with so use yeah, of social especially media. after the you know after the pandemic, after the pandemic right. and, which you know yeah. we had. Uh, here in the United States and elsewhere, you know, we had to rely on these digital means to, you know, transact mm -hmm. or to uh, educate, you know, our children, and that has, you know, created has, some yeah. uh, negative, which is, you know, was it's a good segue for the challenges of for technology. the challenges, yeah, yeah, and and I, I mean um, the, but, but I guess a couple of parts to that. First is how do you how do you think about the, these these ills, these very mm. real ills, mm. in the context of the benefits that we really have been emphasizing so far, yeah. and that I, that 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 are, are clearly very substantial and significant? Um, and then also, how do you think about it as a contrast between um, you know really the rich world and the rest of the world in terms of focusing on these ills as opposed to the benefits? Do you think that there's a fundamental difference, say, between Bangladesh and Northwest Washington D.C., where I live? Yeah, first of all, we should remind ourselves, all technologies have uh, positive effects, if there are any, mm -hmm. and also negative effects. So for instance, cars are helping us move yeah. around, but there are a lot of car accidents. And so, climate change. Uh, yeah, or other problems, yeah. yes. So that's, it's not something totally mm -hmm. new. But for to constrain that, to reduce that, we need regulations, this is why government is there, also responsible um, companies who are producing the service mm -hmm. also need. So for example, uh, General Motors have to build safe cars. So we have that kind of responsibility mm -hmm. on the private sector. And also the government also needs to watch if, if bad activities are being pursued through that. 
So that problem hasn't gone away. That is a normal human problem. Human beings can be messy. But the bottom line is the, there are other problems to be solved. But let's assume if that $4.5 trillion are, let's accept, the $4.5 trillion are being produced for the society as a whole, mm -hmm. then what if we spend um, half a trillion dollars in, in, in restraining those, mm -hmm. those activities? Yeah. Okay. So the bottom line is the societies need to become more efficient. That's how economic growth takes place. And if it does, then some of that extra growth can be utilized in addressing some of the problems. That's the overall conceptual point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But specific cases are there, out there, and that's how I see it. Um, shift, shifting a little bit uh, about uh, you know, how uh, this mobile technology has affected other countries, how do you see the role um, of mobile technology has helped you know, uh, companies like Huawei and Alipay and, and others that uh, as you mentioned, Philip, are more, um, you know, uh, towards more of like a, an authoritarian regime. So can you comment about that? Not really. I'm not an expert <laughs> on authoritarian regimes. But, 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 but these technologies are enabling human beings to be better coordinated with others. That's my main point. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they fall in, in a country that happens to have an authoritarian regime, then, then I is outside my area. Well, <laughs> well, and there's a difference between five G and embedding a five G technology yeah. with surveillance. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 an abuse in some sense that's of an the technology. Abuse, yes, yes. But it doesn't it doesn't mean that the technology itself. I mean, in that in that particular instance, when we think about applications for healthcare, for example, mm -hmm. and I I really I mean, this was something Marty emphasized uh, that I really think is absolutely the case, which is that we're only at the beginning of the right. use of mobile telephony combined with the internet in education and healthcare in particular, and those are the highest cost mm -hmm. and in some sense lowest effectiveness in terms of efficiency areas of the U.S. economy, yeah. and you know we may be replicating that globally, but we don't need to. Because because other parts of the world can leapfrog. Right. And, and again, but with 5G enables, certainly in healthcare, um, you know, uh, things to, to, to be done that aren't possible otherwise. Uh, but then again, if it's corrupt, if the yeah. technology is corrupted in some sense. Yeah, and that's the main, the point that we were discussing, that technology is a tool that can be, you know, used for, uh, you know, good things or yeah. for, you right. know, bad things. Um, so we also have to be, uh, m mindful of that. Yeah. Uh, so one, there are literally hundreds of examples. But let me want make one small point, which is these phones that we are holding. Let's say an iPhone is actually a very powerful computer, mm -hmm. supercomputer in yeah. a decade or two ago, if by that term. Literal, yeah. Literally. So if it is can be hooked onto some other thing that can give rise to a great deal of value. So I'll give you an example. You can buy through Amazon, I think $79, something called Cardia Mobile. Again, I'm not trying to advertise for this company. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that you can hook it up and have your own personal EKG Absolutely. at your home, yeah. okay. mm -hmm. which used to be a very expensive yeah. machine. You would have yeah. to go and, and but a, a person a, in a developing country could provide an EKG in any spot on the planet, or in any, including in a poor country, okay, where a great service is provided, okay, or similarly, another device could be put into the country yeah. because this is a computer. Well, okay. and I'll give you an example of uh, what's happening now in Ukraine. They have, you know, uh, in their phone, they have an, an app called Dia, mm -hmm. uh, which you know USAID helped uh, pr um, set up, right. uh, and they and it's an app that you know contains your uh, digital ID your um, uh, driver's license, uh, your COVID certification, which you know here in the United States we still have the paper cards, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> right? And um, and you know and you and it's like uh, the wallet of wallets. You know you can send also money, you know through um, through through your phone. Yeah, so exactly. it, it's everything uh, you know in one um, one place. Right. Um, and so. Uh, what I'm saying is, you know, we could also be using some of the uh, examples uh, and uh, innovations, you know, such as Grameen Phone or the D app, 
uh, in developed countries. Sure, so, sure. you well, know, absolutely. Uh, and you know. And we have such so, a long way to go. I mean, Romina, just to your point, there's a couple of things that that sparked. One is, I know, uh, you know, how involved CSIS is in Ukraine reconstruction and, uh, you know, that you've taken as an institution a real leadership role in that extremely important topic. And, you know, when we think about the, you know, misfortunes, uh, almost innumerable misfortunes that we had in Iraq yeah. uh, in a similar activity and, you know, literally sending pallets of cash because in some sense that was the best available technology. Well, uh, yeah. mobile telephony, the power of mobile telephony that we've been talking about is a, a, a vitally important national security and economic reconstruction tool and, and really giving serious and deep thought to the ways in which uh, you know mobile telephony, uh, you know connected devices can be an integral part of this process, yes. to me seems to be um, just an, an essential, an essential component. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, one would think when we're, we're having this discussion, one would think it would be obvious. Well, it's not obvious, um, and it's often overlooked. And you know, we think about the hardware of military engagement, which of course is essential in an actual war, um, but then it's the software and this other mm -hmm. hardware mm -hmm. of mobile devices that can be such a significant part of creating the peace. Yeah. Um, the other point I just do want to very quickly allude to the work, uh, we've been talking about visionaries today, but our uh, mutual friend, uh, Bob Lighton, wrote a paper in 2008 about the power of telemedicine. Mm -hmm. mm. And he documented the cost savings in 2008 uh, that were achievable through telemedicine. Right. Um, since then, uh, you know, studying Bob's work, writing some of my own, um, I, I, I'm prepared to make the statement that there is no credible way to bend the cost care in U.S. health care if health services are delivered through outpatient and inpatient facilities. Mm. The only way to do it is by growing health care to the home. Mm. And health, telemedicine is one part of that. Medical house calls are another. All of it depends on ubiquitous uh, uh, high-speed uh, uh, internet access yep. and mobility. Yeah. So it is, and the uh, federal budget deficit issues the United States of America have to do entirely with population aging. Yeah. Well, for yeah. Social Security and Medicare. And so this, this is, is where, the solution for the fiscal yeah. solvency of the United States of America. And this is where developing countries also can um, help play a role in bringing the cost down because, sure. for example, um, I was uh, recently in Brazil where I, I visited an um, a innovation lab where uh, you can read, you know, uh, x-rays and uh, other uh, health um, results from Brazil, right? Yeah. So, Absolutely. Um, and that drives the cost down for the patient and for you know the healthcare facility. So this is an area where you know we have excellent professionals around the world um, that can use technology to uh, you know to to improve our healthcare systems and drive you know and right. improve their right. wages and drive the healthcare costs down. And we have yeah. AI radiologists. Right. right. So you combine all these things. And you think about the scanning technology, which, as Iqbal said, has been also going down by orders of magnitude, yeah. might not be something that everybody has in their home, but could right. be something yeah. that happens in right. every village. Imagine if, if these types of technologies could be available absolutely globally at yeah. one one-hundredth the cost of today. But also, there are many crimes that are being solved, even here, yeah. and as it is in developing countries. Are, because it, these are like eyes and ears for everybody else. My point is, if I see a crime and I take a picture, I take a video, yeah. and submit it, there are many, many things that CNN collects it from mm -hmm. people, and we all can see. Human rights the, All the human rights world, yeah. all, the, all, the, yeah. all the police power abuse, yeah. okay? Yeah. They're being recorded by some individual. By mobile phones, okay? yeah. Because mobile phone and the video camera is right there. Okay? Yeah. And then they can relate. So many yeah. things are being caught. Many co bad acts are being caught. But again, you know, countries have have, have to have uh, you know uh, data protections and uh, cybersecurity uh, enough to uh, also be um, you know mitigating for the. Yes, yes. It's really a race. Bad, so it's uh, really a race. Bad, race. You yeah. see, the, the technology bad, uh, simply stop. simply unleashes possibilities. Yeah. So how and do you how do you see uh, now we're you know talking about AI. Um, how do you see, you know, this, you know, the the smartphone evolving, let's say, and the 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 mobile phone evolving? Because I've seen, you know, um, 
also a little bit of, uh, you know, this morning I've heard that there's like an uptick of uh, the flip phone right now, yeah. you know. Uh, I was going to so bring my, I was trying to find my StarTech. Speaking <laughs> of Motorola, I couldn't find it this morning. That's still my favorite phone. So, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, uh, parents, you know, yeah. elderly parents that, you know, can't really, you know, they, they touch the smartphone and it's really hard for them to, yeah. to use the technology. So, yeah. um, and, you know, we've seen um, e devices like the BlackBerry uh, sort of yeah. in extinction. So how do you see this technology evolving in the future? Um, bigger, smaller, of course, more powerful. But like, uh, do you have like a, um, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, you have a crystal ball, but like, what do you see it happening, you know? So you start. He, he, I have <laughs> no, I, we both have thoughts on this, I'm sure. No, I mean, I, I can see that it would be more powerful. Mm -hmm. okay. That's what that And question. more capable, yeah. etc. So it's a matter of what human, what kind of problems human beings want to solve. Okay. But the power is there. That's how I overall see it. Okay. And uh, if you, but also if you're trying to uh, pursue some bad act, the, it, this also provides a way to catch you because it is traceable everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So that's. I mean, it is. It is a question of how the, so human beings, who are otherwise complicated, messy animals, how they can uh, constrain each other, how, is is the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, and have a civilized society, but the technology is unleashing many possibilities. That's yeah. how I summarize it. Anyway. Philip, what's your view? Well, I, I mean, I think spectacular failures often anticipate uh, the uh, future technological trajectory. Um, so, you know, you had the, uh, the, the Newton, you know, failed basically iPad, uh, and then you had the first smartphone that came a decade before uh, the iPhone. Um, and so I think with, you know, the Google Glass is, you know, it's some sort of version Version of a future uh, that that although it as a technology was uh, spectacularly failed, I think that embeddedness, ubiquity, um, you know, this 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 is our connecting point. But the, the capacity of the phone is shrinking all the time. Mm. And um, it, you know, I, I mean, I'm generally not a singularity cyborg future type of person, uh, but I think some aspects of connectivity uh, will make sense as physically embedded technologies. Yeah. Um, and um, I think also the interactivity that we're seeing with ChatGPT, um, you know, is uh, really the whole hype around the metaverse. The metaverse is another, you know, it's a way of framing it that has that, that has launched as a spectacular failure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg kind of, you know, in this very poorly animated toy world, and people think about that, that's the metaverse. The metaverse is Google Maps. Mm -hmm. We live in the metaverse mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. We exist in the metaverse all the time. When we navigate, when I navigate down the street, I am simultaneously in a digital world and in a physical world. Mm -hmm. They both have almost equal significance. Mm -hmm. And so, so as we think about the convergence of digital and physical, that is where we're heading. And we're talking about more embeddedness and a continued convergence of digital and physical. And the, 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 the metaverse that is of significance and is importance to everybody not to people in Richmond, right. to everybody, right. is, is, is in the convergence of digital and physical through the power of digital technologies, Moore's Law, and as we learned today, an analog to Moore's Law that has to do with spectrum. Right, right. Actually, what, may I say this? Yeah. yeah. What I really celebrate about this cell phone phenomenon is, of course, all that power is there, I accept. But the real thing to celebrate here is that when in 1973, if we look back, okay, there are about 300, 350 million phones. And only the very rich all of phones. the world of, of, of all phones. Only yeah. landlines existed at the yeah. time. There were no cell phones yeah. at the time. Okay. Only the rich of the rich, namely not even all Americans had it. They had it, and in Northern Europe, I mean Western Europe, Japan, and America, they had this. Mm -hmm. And in countries like in many countries in Africa or South Asia, one in 100, one in 500 people had a phone. What, is, what has really altered, and this I want to resonate with what um, Martin Cooper said this morning, that he was a he was little bit lamenting that only 94% have it. What about the 6%? Okay. 
The point is, and he was saying that companies are going for Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. What about Internet of People? That's the money line so of the day. Th that was <laughs> that was Martin Cooper's line. Yeah. But what I'm getting, and frankly, yeah. I did play How, a role in that. Yeah. But what I'm getting at is that the thing to celebrate right now is that what 10% people had is now available to virtually 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think that is something to be celebrated. And then we have to deal with its problems, okay? Yeah, and, and bring the cost down, no? And cost <laughs> further well, down. The cost, but the, but cost they've, they've, they've reduced so no, so much I mean, that so for, much so many people have gotten yeah, it. Yeah, yes. but for you know, um, you know, the smartphones and yes, and, the smartphones, uh, yes. Uh, internet you know, connectivity, yeah. and all uh, the things we're talking about, access to AI. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. I mean, yeah. that's like the next Absolutely. mile for right. developing countries. Right. So, right. so how do right. you see? That evolving, you know, you brought Grameen phone. Um, how do you see, you know, the cost of smartphones and internet going down, you know, for I mean, Africa and yeah. The, I, in my view, frankly, I believe in a little bit of capitalism, but my point is the competition between companies have brought the cost down at the end of the day. Okay? Yeah, and this is why the American innovations and the American innovation machines that brought the cost down needs to be also promoting this technology going further and further down, okay? Hmm. And, and of course, the governments can regulate and constrain, but the bottom line is the costs will go down by, by competition. And there's another extremely important point to celebrate in this, and which we, often we ignore, is that what is happening now, if we think about these phones are helping quote-unquote low-income countries, that's because through this technology, low-income countries are, are leveraging the global economy that is producing these devices. And that's how the costs are actually going down. You know, Romina, um, at the beginning you started about different, you, you asked about different institutional actors, yeah. government, large corporations, and entrepreneurs. And DFIs, uh, yep. And, and DFIs, of course. And, um, there's a paradox in a sense in the history of mobile telephony between the role of Bell Labs as, a, as the financed by monopoly profits, 100%, mm -hmm. and probably the innovation engine of the United States, if there was a single innovation engine, it was Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that and acknowledge that. Now, your reflexive you know, reaction to that is, well, this means monopoly is actually great. And Schumpeter, you know, 1942 was correct that it's actually monopolies and big companies that can produce the greatest innovation. But that's actually 100% incorrect. Mm -hmm. Because what unleashed the mobile revolution was two things. One, Motorola that we've already talked about. Yeah. Um, and the challenge of this outsider and, you know, relative upstart right. even though it was established. But the other thing was the 1956 consent decree between the federal government and Bell Labs. It was the most important legal action of the 20th mm. century. And what that did was it was an arrangement with, with, uh, between the federal government and Bell Labs post-World War II that Bell Labs could keep its monopoly over landlines, but they would not go into computing and they would make their patent portfolio available publicly. It was unlocking that patent portfolio that as much as anything seeded Silicon Valley and, and as well as unlocking the mobile revolution. So it was, historically speaking, correctly speaking, mm -hmm. as documented in multiple uh, scholarly works on this topic, the 1956 consent decree and the competition that ensued was what allowed the value yes, yes. That, 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 that Bell Labs created to be, to be uh, deployed globally. Right. So we and need to maintain that. We need to maintain that, but there's another overall point is that we also need to celebrate the American innovation machine because at the end of the day, all these innovation mostly came from the United States. At this point, it did. Yeah. 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 Well, with that happy note, um, mm. uh, I'm going to close this session and thank, you know, Philip and Iqbal for this thank wonderful um, discussion, and of course, Marty. And uh, we welcome our viewers to continue. Um, in viewing our events and engaging CSIS and uh, and thank you for the uh, live audience and the in-person audience and we're closing the session today so thank you again. thank you for inviting us thank you real pleasure it's great thank you